coming on stage. We have Dr. Jennifer Craig, a great friend, a personal buddy, great dancing partner, and a massive brain. We have Prof. Lyndon Jones, who probably tells more jokes on stage than I do, but an excellent speaker, and James Wolfson, who is incomparable in the size of his grey matter in there to put forward a conference like this and still stand on stage and do it. So, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to welcome uh, Dr. Jennifer Craig, who will be the first speaker to go through the Juice 2 and tell us how to manage and look after dry eye disease and management. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to uh, present to you today the outcomes of the definition and classification uh, subcommittee report from Jews 2, from the TFOS Jews 2. Um, and I'd like to thank the BCLA for giving us the opportunity to present this session. So these are our subcommittee members. And I'd like to thank each and every one of them, and especially Kelly Nichols, who is co-chair with me on this uh, subcommittee report. We have a list of financial disclosures, which are too small to read, but um, I can assure you that none of them were relevant to the presentation that I'm giving today. So the goals of the um, Definition and Classification Subcommittee were to create an evidence-based, a new, a refined evidence-based and contemporary uh, a, a definition and classification for dry eye disease. And our starting point was the original uh, Jews definition and the ones that had gone before that. We used those and then we used the literature that has um, been published in the last 10 years to drive that forward. Um, we were tasked with addressing perceived shortcomings. We had people put forward the problems that they saw with the, the definition and the classification as it was. And using the literature we updated that. And this was done in a consensus-based manner. TFOS Jews 2 involved 150 experts uh, over about two and a half years and very, very many references. Each of the subcommittee reports has on average, well, probably um, just, just under 1,000 on average. Some of the subcommittee reports have over 1,000 references. And so you can imagine the amount of work that's gone into reviewing each of these, ensuring the quality of them, and then um, interpreting them, putting it all together as a consensus for the future. So um, it's very exciting that it's about to be published. So um, the considerations with, our, um, with getting a, a definition, we put out a survey and the, uh, the membership said we want it to be simpler. The original one was two sentences long and that's clearly too many for uh, some people. So they wanted a single sentence. We didn't want the opportunity for um, half the sentence, you know, half of it to be uh, missed off. So they preferred it to be a single sentence, um, but it needed to be sufficiently specific to be able to differentiate dry eye from other ocular surface conditions, because that's really important. We need to know it's dry eye. Uh, people wanted to resolve the confusion between the features of dry eye and which ones are pathophysiological and which ones require to be um, considered as diagnostic criteria. And we also wanted to acknowledge the range of different etiological triggers for dry eye. It, um, there are very many that can cause a dry eye. And wanted to recognise the, um, the neurosensory abnormalities. There's been a lot of literature, or more literature on that in the last 10 years, and that was, it was considered important to acknowledge that. So here is the definition, uh, the TFOS Jews 2 revised definition. So dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface, characterised by a loss of homeostasis of the tear film and accompanied by ocular symptoms, in which tear film instability and hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage, and neurosensory abnormalities play etiological roles. Very streamlined. No, it's um, all in one sentence. So there's a lot of information there. And as you can imagine, each of the words that's in this definition was very carefully considered. So I'll go through them uh, one by one. So dry eye was retained as the name. Um, there, was, there were arguments first word, and we, we were arguing already. Dry eye, as you know, is somewhat of a misnomer for a lot of our um, patients who have a qualitative issue with the tear film rather than quantitative issue. And the, tear, the eye does not appear dry, it appears wet. They come in complaining of a watery eye, not a dry eye. But dry eye 
uh, is a term, and it's kind of branding. It's been described as dry eye for very many years now, and it's important for patients, for clinicians, um, for industry, that the name is retained. Um, it, so that was considered to be uh, important to be kept the same. Multifactorial, that was in the last definition as well, and that's acknowledgement of the, the range of um, etiological drivers for dry eye, very many reasons why you can get a dry eye. The term disease, earlier definitions before the last one, earlier definitions had used condition or dysfunction. Um, but disease, we felt, as, as was the case last time, um, gave due respect to the impact that the, the, this condition has on the ocular surface in terms of the changes in the tear film and the, the ocular surface tissues, and also the impact on quality of life for those affected by it. So it has been retained as a disease. Always important to define where you're talking about. So on the body, we've got the ocular surface. Now the next part is a little bit new. This um, involves the term homeostasis. And that was chosen, that was, it's quite a nice term that helps describe, we, we felt that that would describe all the different, the myriad of, uh, of different things that could happen to the tear film and to the ocular surface in a dry eye, all the different features that could change. And this was considered to kind of encompass all the, um, any type, all and every type of imbalance in the tear film accompanied by ocular symptoms. Now that's actually less specific than we were last time. The last definition said um, symptoms of discomfort or visual disturbance. And what we've done is we've not, we're not dissing those. They are incredibly important. They are still probably the main symptoms that patients will report, but we're broadening it to allow other symptoms to be brought in so that um, in some countries they don't describe dry eye as you know, burny or gritty or um, that some of the, the symptoms we might hear our patients say, they say they're tired and heavy eyes and things. So by broadening it, we, we're allowing um, the definition to be applicable globally. And then in, while it was tempting at this point to, to cut the definition at that point, we quite liked that idea, that would have made it nice and streamlined. We realized that without this other part of it, it was going to be uh, insufficiently specific because basically any ocular surface condition could cause some of those things in the first part. And therefore, it was really important to include some of the features that we consider to be um, unique to dry eye. So it's in, in a dry eye, we have instability, we have hyperosmolarity, the tear film becomes hyperosmolar. Ocular surface inflammation, whether that's as a driver or as a downstream effect, which then gets involved in that vicious circle that keeps, um, the, gives the cycle that keeps going. Um, uh, and damage to the ocular surface. And neurosensory abnormalities have been um, mentioned now in, as one of the etiological factors. So there's the definition. That part's actually out, out and about now. So um, you, you'll find that on the TFOS website if you want to uh, see that in more detail and consider it. What I would say though is you really need to read the report in order to be able to understand it in context. So that will be out in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. So the classification, so the, the purpose of a classification um, is to, there are many reasons why you might want to do a classification, but for us we felt the important thing was to improve, ultimately, is to improve patient care. And therefore we wanted it to be applicable to the clinician, to be helpful to the clinician. And so we took the previous, def, uh, the previous classifications, and you'll recognise that picture on the, um, at the bottom here, that's the, 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 the Jews classification picture that you see a lot in publications. Um, we took the, that one and the previous ones, considered them all and considered some of the shortcomings of them. And so one of those was we wanted there to be an option for diagnosing normal, to be able to diagnose somebody or to do, classify somebody as normal, as, as healthy, not having a dry eye. Um, there was a misperception with the... Um, aqueous deficiency and evaporative dry eye. And in the previous diagram, as you see, they're, um, they're distinct they're in location. In the report, if you'd read the long report, it would have, um, it tells you that they're not mutually exclusive. You can have um, contributions from both of those. But people tended to think of them because the diagram showed them separately, that patients had to be one or the other. And we wanted to convey the fact that there is a lot of overlap between it and patients can have both. And we wanted to be able to do something to try and accommodate the, the patients and the, with, the, with the, um, the conundrum where you have signs but no symptoms or symptoms but no signs. 
because we see a lot of those as well, and to try and um, work out where these, these people fit within the classification system. And so this is what we came up with. So this is going to be your new classification uh, system for dry eye. So it's a little bit different. It's a little bit overwhelming when you look at it all in, in one go. So I'll break it down. We'll start with the bottom of it. The bottom of it is the bit that's going to be most familiar to you. It's kind of where, where we were before. So if we blow that up a little bit, that's got um, somebody being diagnosed as having dry eye disease. And then what you need to do is basically, basically subclassify them according to the contribution of aqueous deficiency compared to evaporate, excess evaporation. So what, what, where are we going to then manage the dry eye? And that's where you then come down to find the appropriate treatment in order to manage uh, this lack of homeostasis. And Lyndon's going to be talking about that um, later. What we've added is this whole big section at the top. And this is a, like a, a flow chart to help you with uh, the patients that turn up. And basically, it covers four different types of patients. It covers those with signs and symptoms. And those are the ones that, um, and James will talk about that, um, those are the ones that will be diagnosed with a dry eye. There's, that's something we need to be careful about on the way down to make sure that they don't have any other conditions, masquerading as a dry eye, that needs separate treatment. Um, but these are the ones that will follow down into the dry eye, path, dry eye disease path that will be managed. There's the group who are symptomatic, but they don't have any signs that can be detected clinically. There's a group that's asymptomatic, but do have signs, so the other conundrum. And then there's the group that have no signs and no symptoms, so they're, they're the lucky ones. So let's go back and deal with each of those just in a little bit more detail. So this is the patients who are symptomatic with signs of um, ocular surface disease. These ones um, will run through this triaging system that James will talk about to ensure there's nothing else, and then we'll follow down onto the path, diagnosed as a dry eye, subclassified and managed appropriately. That's the idea. Over here, we've got patients with symptoms but no signs. So these may be patients, there are two kind of options here. It may be patients who are very early in the disease process. They're detecting some symptoms before we're able to pick it up in practice. Perhaps the tests that we have um, are not sensitive enough to pick it up, very subtle signs. Those patients need to, um, you may give some prophylactic advice, um, but they, they need to be watched. They need to be monitored to make sure that they don't then uh, develop the signs, because if they develop the signs, by then their symptoms and signs, and they follow back down into that path and require dry eye management. Another reason why you might have symptoms but no signs is that there may be a contribution from, from um, neuropathic pain. Now, neuropathic pain is not um, dry eye, and it's a very small proportion of patients, but there are some of these patients that no matter what you do with the dry eye therapy, they don't make things any better because they actually have a central disorder. And that requires pain management through um, other physicians, not through, um, through an optometrist. We then have the patients who are asymptomatic with, um, with signs. So how, how does that turn up as dry eye? Well, they, they appear and in your clinic, perhaps they just, uh, it's an incidental finding before you're fitting contact lenses, before they're going for surgery. Um, and they're showing signs, but without complaining of anything. And that might be because, um, sorry, they're, um, so the, 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 these are the incidental findings, or it might be because the cornea is neurotrophic. So if the cornea doesn't have the sensitivity it should have, then they won't be complaining of symptoms, but they may have frank signs. And for those patients, they will obviously do require management, um, but you need to, what we have allowed in this classification system is to separate them out to understand how they're getting into this path where they may undergo management. And that way we can set realistic expectations for patients and we can set real realistic expectations for researchers and for industry and regulatory um, processes. If you're trying to prove that somebody gets better um, with treatment, you're not going to get an improvement in symptoms if they didn't start with symptoms. So it helps us categorize the patients better. And then you've got the group with no signs and no symptoms. And these are our healthy individuals that we're able to classify as normal. So there's the, the entire uh, picture. You'll see that as well as the parts that I've shown you, there are um, little tags here to, uh, for those who are interested in reading more about it. And each of those um, areas is discussed within one or other of the reports and that's labeled there as well so that you can follow up on it 
if you want more information. So, um, in conclusion, uh, the, um, we've hopefully created a definition and a classification that helps differentiate dry eye disease from other diseases that should be managed other, in other ways, other um, associated ocular surface conditions. We've considered the, the conundrum of the signs with no symptoms or symptoms with no signs, and we've tried to show that overlap by having the the merging of the aqueous deficiency and evaporative at either ends of a spectrum to show that you can have contributions from both of those. They're not mutually exclusive. And having said that, the, the, um, the approach isn't intended to um, override your clinical assessment. And that's obviously still very important in your judgment, but it's designed to help guide clinical management and future research. And finishing up, I'd just like to acknowledge the 150 people who were involved in, um, in, in the whole thing, so everybody got to contribute, especially the um, definition finalization group um, who came in right at the end to help finalize that definition, the illustrators, and also to, to TFOS and particularly Amy Sullivan who generated the, the funds through their sponsors um, to be able to support this and absolutely the sponsors without whom this would not have been possible. So thank you very much for your attention. And I don't know if uh, Brian coming back to introduce you or no. So the, <laughs> I'd like to introduce <laughs> Professor James Wilson, who's going to come and talk to you now about the diagnostic part of it. So that's the definition and classification into diagnostic, and then we'll be talking about management. Thank you, James.